well to the people here. We were pretty low in voices in 1995 when we first did the surveys in the Tahoe Basin and uh, around Lake Tahoe and Tahoe Keys. Uh, what I want to talk about specifically is projects in the Tahoe Keys where we're going to be looking at controlling um, <coughs> the rainwater milfoil and through the pondweed uh, with methods that we currently have available. And as you're probably aware, we don't have the methods that are used in many other states um, for lakes that is applied to herbicides. And again, it's the we. There's a bunch of us involved with this. Um, the UNR is doing some of the fish studies up there, and I think we'll hear some more about that later. Uh, but I'm going to focus a little bit on the plants and um, the objectives we have. What we really want to do is compare water barriers, and these are both uh, membrane systems and also a natural uh, fiber called jute. Uh, that we're going to put on the bottom. We're going to be looking at the movement of dyes in the, in the top key because the dye study is, uh, allows us to use that as a surrogate for what could be the movement of aquatic herbicides. So we want to get some data on that uh, down the road in case there's an option for using aquatic herbicides. And then we want some baseline data on invertebrates, um, benthic invertebrates. So we'll be doing some sampling with you and our collaborators to find out what's happening on the bottom of those barriers next to them in areas where we're not uh, doing any action at all. And then last of all, we've got this uh, feasibility of using mechanical methods um, and how those things may impact homeowner fish populations. Just to remind you, you've heard a lot about uh, this already. I just want to focus on this tail end here. This was an important period, 2007 on up, when the awareness really was accentuated uh, with our workshop and with the advent of Florida mussels you know, neighboring uh, lakes up there. But uh, just kind of give you a, pur a purview of what's happening in the lake uh, all the way back to the uh, so these are the sites that we're concerned with <coughs> for water fish removal, and that's going to be an important topic next uh, next speaker. But I want to point out these are uh, red stars are the locations where currently pondweed is, and that these two plants, milfoil and pondweed, provide a habitat for one water fish. So our program is actually coordinated so we can remove the fish from the plants, hopefully remove the habitat for the non-native warm water fish, and then uh, open up those habitats for native uh, fish production. In case you don't know what these look like, that's the rainwater milk oil, currently <coughs> pondweed. And um, I'm going to show you some structures that make these things really difficult to control, particularly um, when we be crispus or currently pondweed. That plant, by the way, has a very interesting life cycle. Instead of producing its probigules in the fall, the way most of these aquatic plants do, it produces them in the spring. And these probigules are called turions, that's about the size of one. And each plant will produce perhaps a dozen or two or three dozen of those turions in the spring, and uh, in fall rather. And then for those things to fall off the plant, they sprout in the fall. And so they have an advantage over the native uh, plants that are out there because they've already sprouted in the, in the late summer, early fall, and they're ready to take off when that water warms up uh, in, the, in the spring and summer. And in addition to that, these things are attached to plants <coughs> that spread around by boats, by wind action, and all the rest of it. So they're really easily dispersed. The system. Just to show you what some of this looks like, <coughs> here's how it's going to be quadweed. You can't see it because of the light, but in this mass of plants that pulled up, there's probably a couple of dozen of those trions right there in the channel of the keys. Uh, you've seen this map before. I uh, wanted to point out, though, that the focus of uh, the Christmas work is in the south end because that's where we've seen most of it moving in that direction. And that's what a quadweed the, the looks like. Um, this is probably about two square meters in the south shore, and from there it probably has been spreading in the last three or four years along the eastern side. So when we first looked at the pond weeds, we figured out we could do a control or eradication with these, and notice the date right back there, pretty cheap. Well, we're now into 2012, <coughs> almost, and these are perhaps a little bit high numbers, but we're talking about complete removal of all plant parts, all turions, and all the rest of them. So it's a pretty heavy load to be, to be lifting, and I'm not sure we can do that, actually. But as far as the keys go, we're going to be looking at these methods um, uh, and, and alternatives. And, and what I want to point out is with the mechanical methods that have been used in the last, say, 15 years, harvesting, not only do you produce fragments from both those species, but you also stimulate their growth. Just like you cut your lawn, and it just stimulates more growth from below. So we've actually had a problem with the, the mechanisms that have been used there in the keys in the last 15 years. So this is what it looks like in the harvester. You can't see because of the light, but all that dark area is the primarily either pondweed or milfoil in the keys. So we'll be looking at various
barrier, so here's an example of the barrier that was laid down in Negro Bay. That's the barrier, that's outside the barrier. So we're looking at how much time it takes to kill that plant. Most of the literature points to about four to six weeks of cover to kill those plants. So here's our strategy for best management practices. <coughs> we'll be conducting surveys uh, next month. Because the ice can up here. We'll be looking at uh, the dye study in June. And that's going to tell us how the water moves in, that, in the system and how the dye material moves with it. We'll be looking at the efficacy and impacts of these water barriers to reduce biomass uh, invertebrates, as I mentioned, and then recommendations for best options. Uh, you're probably aware that there's an option uh, that's being discussed for changing the basin plan to allow the exemption and, and use of aquatic herbicides possibly in another year or two. So this information is going to provide us some background and baseline information that will allow us to make recommendations perhaps for a herbicide type of project. And I want to point out the importance of this dye study right now. Uh, in addition to our <coughs> studies on water barriers, in order to make a herbicide work you have in a target plant, you've got to have the right contact time, <coughs> placement, and concentration. <coughs> so the dye study is going to help us figure out what that target is for the conditions in the tunnel of heat as a starting point. And for the dye study, we'll be using a barometer that allows us to measure in parts per trillion. So we can actually see that dye with that instrument, and we cannot see it with the naked eye, which makes it a really good system, a good surrogate for looking at herbicide movement. And there's water in that public piece. You probably can't see this. These are the, the target levels we're looking for, about 10 parts per billion. That's one part per million where you begin to see some pink color in the system. And this dye has been used all over the United States to determine water flow um, as a surrogate of herbicides in the aquatic system. So it's not a new technique, it's not new technology, but it's new for us as they talk. <coughs> so when you do the dye study, <coughs> determine a half-life based on the dissipation rate of that dye, and it gives you an idea of what a typical aquatic herbicide half-life will be and where it's going to move within the system. This is rather important because if we do get to a point where we have a pilot study, we need to also know where to set up those monitoring stations to determine the level of the of herbicide after it's been introduced. Just to end up on the discussion real quickly, we've done a lot of uh, intense surveys of the keys. Um, this was done a couple years ago, as I said, and this coming May we'll do it again. This will tell us where the species are with each of the fingers of the key. <coughs> and we have a tentative location for some of the, the bottom work we're talking about now. And that's, that's shown here with this uh, purple color around the keys. We're working with the Tahoe Keys property owners to develop the right sites. We have cooperation from the neighbors and the owners and so on. So what we're hoping to do uh, by this time next year, we'll have data on the effect of the bottom barriers, uh, harvesting and some information on how water moves uh, the dyes within the keys. Okay, we'll stop there. Good time. That's great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.